Today I've got a smaller project, nothing too fancy, but it's got a lot of heart. This project, it's going places, like literally. Once finished, if all goes well, this will be just a tiny piece in a big machine that will tour the world. The world, I tell you. Thought I'd share. I'm sure we all know Wintergarten, musician extraordinaire, engineer, and creator of the marble machine. And no, unfortunately, he isn't in this box. Though he is here with us. Say hi, Martin. Hi, Martin. If you haven't been following along, Martin is working on the next generation marble machine, the MMX. He's been doing some brilliant work. You should certainly head over to his channel and check it out. At the rate he's going, the MMX will be finished like tomorrow. Not all too long ago, we got to talking and he asked if I'd be willing to make a few parts for the MMX. I said, the MM what? I jumped cut at the chance to contribute to what is sure to become a piece of history. I can already see the original marble machine behind some glass. Wax statue of Wintergarden about to pull a lever. You know, in a museum somewhere. Probably on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls. We talked a bit more and after weaseling out of as much actual work as I possibly could, Martin sent me this. Drum roll please. We're going to try to make this for him, or parts of it anyway, right now, live, pre-recorded for YouTube. I took the liberty of turning his CAD into a first year drafting assignment. Not totally necessary, but makes using the micrometers a little easier. I'd like to stress that this is all his work. This is his design. I'm just turning the knobs and making the chips. I'm not 100% sure what this does, but he calls it a marble elevator, I think. So I can only assume it elevates marbles. Maybe a marble conveyor? Between me and you, I'm getting a very Manhattan Project kind of a vibe. A few people scattered all over the globe, not talking to each other, working on small parts of a bigger machine no one fully understands except Martin himself. I assume, when it's done, in the hands of Martin, it should make beautiful music and or control the weather. Not totally sure which. In any case, he's not paying me to ask questions. In fact, he's not paying me a- Let's look at the drawing. There is frankly not much here, mechanically, though that is one of the hallmarks of good mechanical design. Nonetheless, I'll do my best to make a mountain out of a molehill. There are two identical shafts, each built up with two keyed clutch bearings and two keyed chain sprockets. The clutch bearings and the sprockets are off the shelf parts. The sprockets just need to be sized, bored, and keyed. Along with this, there's a custom countersink washer and M6 screws that keeps the whole thing together. This is two identical assemblies. Let's take this a piece at a time and we can talk about what it does once it's all, well, halfway put together. Now this is a metric project. It calls for 18 millimeter shafting, which I don't have unfortunately, but I have something close. And I have just enough to get both shafts out of if I don't screw anything up. Hopefully both of the washers too, although the washers will be a tad undersized. Hope you don't mind, Martin. If you own more than one chuck for your lathe, the wrong one is always mounted. This is my three jaw, and let's talk about why there may be better options. I'll be turning down to a shoulder on each end of both shafts. That means once I cut one side, I need to flip them to cut the other. I can't do it all in one operation. I mean, you could do this between centers and I suppose do it in one operation, but a normal person would do it in two operations. Every time you take work out of the lathe, out of your chuck and put it back in, whether you're flipping it or not, you'll have concentricity to worry about. Like when you clamp this down and cut one end, that end will be concentric to the axis of the lathe. And depending on the quality of your chuck or if you dialed it in, that may or may not be concentric to the body of the part. And when you flip it and take the other cut, you potentially yet have another axis that that feature is cut around. In this case, this is a sprocket shaft for a chain drive. We'll get to that later. My three jaw chuck would probably be fine. The two ends might be out by, I don't know, five thou, concentrically speaking. For a sprocket drive, again, that's probably not the end of the world. But I'd like to do as nice a job as I can here. After all, the last thing I want is for my parts to bust Martin's balls. <clears throat> Could solve the problem with a four jaw chuck. Dial the work in with an indicator every time. Every time you flip the part or change the part or move the part in any way, dial it back in with the four jaw. But come on, I mean, who's got time for that? Don't even get me started on loosening your chuck back plate and knocking around your three jaw. <sighs> 
Since I have one, I'm going to go with the collet chuck. That, after all, is the advantage of a collet chuck. If you do a lot of work with bar stock, they're indispensable. And this one should get me well within a thousandth of an inch across both ends. Now, no matter how many times I take this part out, or flip it around, this chuck can maintain a much higher concentricity than the three-jaw chuck. I only need to turn about an inch on each end. For this size work, the live center isn't strictly necessary. In fact, it might even make things worse. But for filming purposes, I like to have the stock further away from my chuck. It gives me a couple other options with the camera. With this much stick out, I most certainly need that end support. If you weren't here, I would have choked up a lot more on this stock and not used the live center. I can't even see that mark. Both ends are done. The overall length is correct. The shoulder length is right. They're drilled, countersunk, and tapped. Last thing I need to do on the lathe is take down the body size. I've switched to a different insert with a larger nose radius. Fingers crossed I get a nice finish at a reasonable feed rate. Okay, I think this is it. One down, one more to go. I'm just kidding. I already set the lathe to two. Next up are the key seats and we'll do that on the mill. First thing I need to do before I can cut the slot for the key is find the center line of the shaft. It's in the vise. The vise is square to the machine. Put in just some aluminum shims to keep from marring the shaft. And I've got my edge finder in there. Lately I've taken to using the DRO's half function to find the center of parts. I used to not bother. I would have an edge finder in there, touch off on the side of the work, move over half the diameter of the edge finder, and then half the diameter of the work. And although that's worked great, I mean, still works great. You do have to be a little bit careful with your dimensions and your edge finding technique. With the half function on the DRO instead, I don't need to worry about taking an accurate measurement of the part. And as long as my edge finding technique is consistent, the diameter of the edge finder doesn't matter either. Maybe old news, but let me walk you through it. I'm gonna to touch off on one side first and zero the DRO. Now I'm going to touch off on the opposite side the same exact way. That'll result in some dimension, and when I hit the half button, I should get the center line. Now if I move the machine to zero, that should be the center line of my part. It's a relative move. As long as you're consistent with reading your edge finder, you do the same on both sides, half that distance that you move will be the center line of the part. Yeah, I know, maybe it's 12 of one and six dozen of another. But this way, I don't have to worry about an exceedingly accurate measurement on the part, or know exactly when my edge finder is edge finding. So the shafts are done, teed, threaded, countersunk, all that stuff. Bearings fit nice. I've also made up the little end washers. Nothing too fancy here, just thick countersunk washers. Next, I'd like to move on to these sprockets. I've actually already drilled and bored them to size. 
and I had to clean off about five or six thou off the face to get them to match Martin's drawings. I don't think you're supposed to do that, you know, modify the width, but again, it's a chain drive, and I got the impression from Martin's CAD that the overall width and position of the components is probably more important. These need to be slotted for a key, for the matching key that locks it to the shaft, and the back requires some work. There's a step and an overall dimension I need to work to. I was actually looking forward to cutting that in the filing machine. It's small, it's four millimeters. Thought I could plunge mill most of it and then clean it up on the filing machine. As I was looking for a file to fit these dimensions, it dawned on me that I had a four millimeter brooch. I've actually never used this before. It's still in its original plastic and sharp as a whip. Apparently it came with a shim too. What I don't have are the bushings for this. So this is pushed through the sprocket in the press, cutting the slot for the key, but I need a bushing to keep it in place. I'm gonna make that bushing. Before I do that, I'm gonna take the sprocket to final depth, I guess, thickness, just so I'm minimizing the amount of broaching this little thing needs to do. You see the setup here, the sprocket and the forejaw with the indicator being used to dial the part in? This right here is what's called poetic justice. Ha <laughs> ha! I had no other way to hold the sprocket to modify the hub. Maybe I could have used the shaft that this goes onto with the washer and the locking screw, but I've got a good bit of material to remove off that hub, and this will let me take heavier cuts. Despite the egg on my face, ha, ha. the sprockets are all to print. They're not clean, but they're to print. They have an overall hub length critical to the shaft stack up, and there's a reduced section that ensures it only makes contact with the center race on the bearings. You probably can't see that, but it keeps it from potentially touching the shield. I also made the brooch bushing. Nothing too exciting here. It's got a primary diameter that fits inside of the sprockets, rather a 12 millimeter bore. I'll stamp it on here somewhere and keep this, of course. There's a shoulder at the top, sort of a head to keep it from going through. And there's a slot milled through it that fits the brooch. I've sized the depth of the slot so that pushing the brooch through without any shim results in a half millimeter, 20 thou depth of cut. These, of course, cut in multiple passes. After each pass, you'd introduce a shim in the back that pushes the brooch forward, increasing the depth of cut by whatever the shim thickness is. By the way, if there's anyone out there that's wondering what authority or business I have talking about these things, I'd just like to bring to your attention that the sweater I'm wearing has elbow patches. I'm pretty sure those speak for themselves. Let's head over to the press and push this brooch through. This would be a much better job for an arbor press like a small little manual arbor press. I don't own an arbor press. This is also the smallest brooch I've ever pushed in this hydraulic press, and you can bet I'm wearing every pair of safety glasses I own. One thing I've never liked about this thing is how it moves in sort of fits and starts. I mean, it works great for constant load stuff like pressing parts, bending, etc., but it's too heavy-handed for delicate stuff like this. I might rebuild this press sooner than later. Anyway, yes, you're looking at two sprockets, though it's only cutting one of the two. Specifically, I'm actually already on my third, and it's cutting the third one now. I realized almost too late that the sprockets need to be timed to each other in sets of two. So the keys need to be in the same location between two sprockets on the same shaft. I used an already keyed sprocket to align the whole setup. Before I get these mixed up, I think I'll label the pairs. Again, two of each of these fit on a shaft, followed by a bearing. Though these are actually clutches, or one-way bearings. Sprag clutches. They look a lot like bearings, but they only spin in one direction. This type of bearing, or clutch, is used to transmit torque in one direction only not the other. In this case specifically, they're used to hold a load from moving backwards. Think of them sort of like the ratchet in the head of this wrench. Easy to push the handle one way, but if I let go, the handle doesn't fall back down. I can only apply torque in one direction, not the other. 
Here they're being used to hold marbles. Brackets will have a chain connecting them. There'll be some sort of marble carrier array linked to that chain. As it turns, it can lift marbles. When the motive force stops, the marbles can't back drive. They can't roll backwards the other way. They can raise, but they can't lower. Now, a very quick search on my phone shows that these bearings, or these sprag clutches, are good to about 7.5 newton meters. That number doesn't mean too much to me, but a newton is about a quarter pound. Think of a newton as the quarter pounder of the metric world. So that would be seven and a half, let's round it to eight, eight quarter pounders. Eight quarter pounders is two pounds. We're starting to get somewhere. Now we need to deal with the meters. A meter is about three feet, depending on whose foot you're talking about. So two pounds times three feet, that's almost six foot pounds of torque. Taking into account my Wild West math, somewhere between five and six foot pounds, which consequently is about 60 to 70 inch pounds. Looking at the shaft, at the sprocket, if we imagine we have a chain hanging, say, an inch away from that center line, that's almost 70 pounds one of these can hold. And since there are two, this shaft is holding somewhere in the neighborhood of 140 pounds. For a marble conveyor, that's quite ballsy. Get out of here and shut the front door. My apologies. What I meant to say is with this subassembly, Martin will be able to keep a lot of balls in the air. A lot of balls in the air. Now you could argue since there's two shafts and four sprag clutches, it's actually twice that load rating. Maybe, but let's not get lost in semantics. For these things to hold anything at all, the sprocket and the bearing need to be keyed to that shaft. There's a key cut into all the parts. The clutches have a key on the inner race, and that's what we'll work on next. Speaking of quick phone glances, wanna see what happens when you order the parts on the phone at highway speeds? Don't text and drive, my friends. These are four millimeter square keys. And you might be thinking to yourself, those look a little short. And you'd be right. So I'm gonna use two per side. Essentially one per component. Sprocket clutch, sprocket clutch, etc. I figure this way I give Martin some more stuff to drop. The drawing calls for four millimeter rectangular keys, not square keys. So I have to mill one dimension down. I have to make these four by three instead of the four by four they currently are. I'm gonna to try to do two of these at a time. One pass, taking off 40 thou. Basically right to size. Place your bets. What are the odds one of those two goes flying out of the vise? Didn't go flying, so technically you lost. Take two. Machining multiples like you just saw me do in the mill is always a bit of a gamble, so be careful. However, not only did I not lose any of the pieces, they all came out to size. You think they just hand out YouTube channels to anybody that asks? Normally I wouldn't dare to do such a thing, pound my name on other people's parts like this. However, and first, the way this is assembled, these parts are completely hidden. No one will ever see the text. It's just between me, you, and Martin. Until 4072, that is. A thousand years from now, the MMX will be discovered frozen at the bottom of a liquid methane sea on Titan. A thousand years after that, an ingenious craftsman from the New Australia colony We'll reverse engineer it using only a handful of scans from a pocket-sized hobby MRI. My name will be the only text that survives, cementing me forever in history as the creator of the MMX. Well, that's just great. I'm sure to screw. I've got an idea. Boo! <gasps> Whew. Be grateful you're not smelling what I'm smelling. So I think that's it. Pretty straightforward, huh? But you know, I'm glad I could be of some help. Wait a minute. We should probably try this thing out.
At this point, you'd likely assume that I must now somehow get these parts to Martin. But if I got my timing right and everything went according to plan, Martin should already have these parts. You see, I realize this might be hard to follow, I apologize, but this video that you're watching right now already happened. It happened in the past. Martin, if you ever get out of here, I need you to do me a favor. Up north, there's this big olive grove on a big slope with a breathtaking view of mountains in the distance. In that grove, in the shade of an old olive tree, you'll find a big red arrow that has no earthly business being there. There's something buried there I want you to have. Say what the name.